Hello, and welcome Central Neighborhood residents to the mapping feedback exercise for the zoning code rewrite. To make you aware on where we stand regarding the overall schedule of this project, we have completed the main components of the new form-based code. We've met with City Council several times to discuss the new code and are now in a position to take feedback on the mapping of our new form zone overlays, which requires feedback from you as you are a resident or a property owner in this subject neighborhood. This video provides you with the methodology that was used to apply our form zone overlays to the residential portions of the central neighborhoods, and it's intended to be viewed prior to filling out a brief questionnaire that is embedded in this project's guiding golden page. This video is intended for individuals who rent or own residentially zoned property in the central neighborhoods, but of course, all are welcome to view. So to jump right in, I want to go over the basic concepts of the new code and how it has been applied to this area of the community. The image on the left is a representation of the central neighborhoods, which is bordered to the north by the core of downtown in 14th Street. It's bordered to the west by US 6th Avenue, but also the Colorado School of Mines campus, which has been hatched out in white. It's generally bordered to the south by the property that houses the Golden High School, as well as the Fossil Trace Golf Course, and then bordered to the east by South Table Mountain. The residential zone districts included in this area of the community are the R1 and R1A zone districts, which are represented in yellow, the R2 zone district, which is represented in orange, and the R3 zone district, which is represented in red. These zone districts have existed for the past several decades and all promote uniform standards. What this means is if, for instance, you have an R3 zoned property, you are permitted the same set of rules as all of your neighboring property owners with R3 zoning. When it comes to things like building setbacks from the property line, maximum building heights, maximum lot coverages, and other things. This is also true of the R1 and R1A zone districts and the R2 zone district. Each of these three zone districts, or four, has their own unique set of rules, but they are applied as a one-size-fits-all list of regulations to every property within their boundary. A good rule of thumb to consider with these zone districts are that R1 and R1A properties have a corresponding list of development regulations that permit single family uses and how to construct those single family uses into buildings. The R2 zone district permits medium scale multifamily developments, but also single family developments that have, but the R2 has a similar corresponding list of regulations as does R1. R3 permits large-scale multifamily and also has its own uniform list of standards. Now, many of you may be aware that our current residential zone districts have created issues in the past because they permit structures much larger than the surrounding built environment. Our standard zoning, R1, R1A, R2, and R3, were written at a time when large development was desired. Today in Golden, as reflected in our comprehensive plan, the desire is to promote different scales, meaning the size of development that match the existing built environment, which often exhibits smaller scale developments. If you have found yourself walking down your residential neighborhood, which has a lot of small scale houses or cottages, and then all of a sudden you see a big giant house that's new or a big new duplex, it's because our current zoning isn't sensitive to the surrounding context. The new code recognizes that there are different development patterns within R1 through R3 and introduces a revised list of development standards that scale back the overall size of structures to better match the built environment. If you look at the map on the right side of the screen, you'll see different areas that are called form zones and they're represented by different colors. These different form zones are overlaid on top of the R1, R2, and R3 zone districts 
to specifically control the scale of buildings, but also building types. It's important to note that moving forward, though, we will still maintain two mapping systems for zoning. The zoning code rewrite effort was not about changing what uses are permitted on the property itself. If you have multifamily zoning when you enter this process, you shall have multifamily zoning when you exit this process. These boundaries remain to determine the uses that are permitted on these properties. In other words, the R1N and R1A, the R2 and the R3 boundaries indicate what you can build on your property. And then the boundaries on the right, the form zones indicate how you can build those uses on your property. In the next few slides, I'm going to talk about the two form zones that were mapped to this area of the city with regards to residential development. There is also a separate video to discuss commercial development and zoning. To begin, I will talk about the multifamily areas and then end the presentation with a discussion of our single family R1 and R1A areas. So how does our new form zone overlay promote developments that are reflective of the types of development we see in the community today? It does so through a system called form types. Each form zone includes a list of predetermined pre development templates that mimic the common structures that are found in our residential areas of Golden. The consultants that put our new form-based code together studied Golden's built environment and compiled a list of the core residential forms that are most common in our residential neighborhoods. These include houses, cottages, and duplexes. These three, houses, cottages, and duplexes. However, moving forward, large-scale multi-unit developments, which have popped up on rare occasion in these neighborhoods, will only be permitted in very specific areas of the city where those types of forms are common. Replacing those large-scale multi-unit developments are now clusters and compounds, which are comprised of small-scale cottages on small lots. This is our new multifamily development pattern. As I mentioned, the use of these properties is not changing. For instance, multifamily R2 and R3 will remain multifamily, but moving forward, if one wishes to construct multifamily, it has to be separated into a series of small scale cottage like structures. Each form type, as I mentioned, is a development template. And it contains very nuanced restrictions when it comes to things like building setbacks, maximum building heights, and lot coverages. But it's important to note that for the first time, we are placing a maximum cap on the overall structure size, or in other words, the maximum finished square footage. This is a basic introduction to form types. If you want to do a deep dive on the topic, additional resources are available on the Guiding Golden page. Each of the form zones I will discuss in the next few slides has a very specific curated, curated list of form types that are permitted within its boundaries. So I want you to keep in mind those core form types that I mentioned on the previous slide, houses, cottages, duplexes, compounds, and clusters. Because when it comes to mapping the form zones across our multifamily zone districts, R2 and R3, all of those properties begin as core, meaning they are permitted the core form types because those are the form types that are most common to our residential areas. However, if it was observed that on the half block of a street, there existed a multi-unit development, the full block was considered an area of transition. And that is represented here by these orange dots. We are transitioning from a core neighborhood to a more multifamily neighborhood. And that's present from these multifamily developments. In addition, if a property was located along a major roadway, such as Ford Street, Jackson Street, or Washington Avenue, 
it is also considered an area of transition, which in this case provides a buffer between the activity of the roadway to that of the core of the residential neighborhood. Core neighborhood buffered by transitioning zoning from the, the main roadways in the neighborhood. In addition, if a property is bordering a major change in zoning, meaning you're transitioning from a residential neighborhood to a commercial district like the Jackson Street Corridor, or if you're transitioning from a residential neighborhood to a high intensity uh, institutional use like the Colorado School of Mines, you are also considered to be in a transitioning area. For the purpose of the central neighborhoods, all properties with multifamily R2 or R3 zoning fall within the criteria of the transition form zone. So what's permitted in transition over core? If you are applied the transition overlay, you are still permitted the core form types as I mentioned, houses, cottages, duplexes, compounds, and clusters. You are also permitted the triplex form type. The main takeaway though, again, is that the form type categories permitted here are the only types of developments permitted. If one was to construct a commercial use in these zone districts, which is permitted under special circumstances, they would have to locate that use into one of these residential form types. A good example is occasionally you might see a, a dentist located in a house or a cottage. We feel the form types prevent the unknown that can come out of a more generic list of zoning regulations like we have in our current code. And again, each of the form types caps the maximum size of finished square feet for the first time to scale back the overall size of development. So the previous slides provided context for our multifamily zoning. What about R1 and R1A, our single family zoning? Well, actually not much is changing here. The reason being is that these are zone districts, R1 and R1A, that only permit single family uses. You could imagine that with multifamily development districts like R2 and R3, we have to be more mindful to provide appropriate development templates or form types that can blend in with both the single family development present and the multifamily um, buildings that are potentially possible in these areas. But with R1 and R1A, we only permit single family homes. Therefore, moving forward, the peripheral form zone, which you see in green here, will only permit single family form types. These form types are similar, and in total, there's actually just three of them. The one not shown is a variation of the village house presented here, and is the only difference being that it permits access from the street or the side street when an alleyway is not present. The restrictions of these form types are similar to what you find in R1 and R1A today, with the big exception that we are now placing a maximum building size cap, or again, a maximum total finished square footage on each of these form types if you wish to construct. This does not include things like finished basements. So if you had a finished basement, you could add it to this 3,000 square foot cap. And it also does not include uh, unconditioned um, space, things like garages and attics. With that, I'm going to actually conclude my presentation. I appreciate you taking the time to listen. Please do feel free to fill out our brief questionnaire provided on the Guiding Golden page and let us know what you think about the mapping. If you feel that the form types presented are too intense, then let us know. If you feel like we can accommodate more intense development, then please let us know. We will take the feedback, consider and present it to City Council and make adjustments as needed. Thank you and have a good day.